Awesome. Thank you so much, Marti, um, for the intro and for the opportunity. So as um, has been mentioned, the, to, this evening we are speaking about fluids, so pediatric resuscitation and maintenance fluid therapy. Um, and my biggest disclaimer is actually that this is not a specific area of expertise for me. So, um, and it just, we happened to stumble upon this um, this talk just by having launched the standard treatment guidelines last year. So the, the review cycle ended for the STG's um, pediatric hospital level in 2023. And so we had a launch webinar where we spoke about many things that were changed and updated in the STGs. And one of them was on fluids and it was a very popular topic. I think um, that's evidenced even by this evening's webinar where we have quite a lot of registrations and attendees already. Um, and so my disclaimer is that actually, I'm gonna talk about the fluid management as we've changed it and amended it for the STGs in the past review cycle. Um, and just a little bit about the process of, of the decision-making, how that actually goes about what goes into it. Okay, so just quickly to go over this. Actually, no, Marty, before, um, before we go there, actually, what, can we do the polls now? So before we actually get into a content, we actually just want to see there's a lot of data that suggests that um, fluid management differs. There's not a lot of... Um, there's not a lot of consensus as to how things should be done. There is evidence to support for certain aspects, but then there is a, a paucity of evidence in other aspects of fluid management. And so we actually just want to quickly do a poll. There's three quick questions um, that people can please answer. So Mati, if you can launch, I can't see it at the moment, um, but if we can launch the poll so that people can um, start that and then we'll see what what's actually happening out there like in in the real world in clinical practice marty i'm not sure if the the polls are up Oh, there we go, amazing. Okay, so if everybody doesn't mind, just to quickly complete, there's just three quick questions about really what you do in your practice and what your preferences are. So question one, when you do have to use IV fluid rehydration, uh, fluid therapy for a severely dehydrated child, we assume normal electrolytes, what's your go-to fluid? What do you select first? So if you can answer that one. Um, and then when you have a moderately dehydrated child, um, who requires rehydration but doesn't want to drink RS, what do you choose in that situation? Do you go for the IV route? Do you opt for the nasogastric route? Is that an option that's available to us? Because that should have been part of the question. Um, and then there's a multi-select. You can choose many answers about um, the oral route, the enteral route versus the parenteral route. So maybe let's just give Are you another. able to see the answers? So I can't I see, see the answers. Okay, so what I can see, um, I hope they can also see this, is that for the first question, um, when choosing IV therapy for a severely dehydrated child, it's very interesting, 42% want that half DD. Um, and the next favorite is actually 5% um, dexaline. Then okay. it's ringers lactate. Um, so 5% um, dexaline is 19%. Ringers is 18%. And then um, plasma light B is 11%. And only 3%, thank goodness, use PMS. And then 7% uh, felt like it depends. Then okay. um, the second, when we're choosing for moderately dehydrated children, um, it's a very close one. So 47% um, use the IV route and 53% opt for the nasogastric tube route. So nasogastric rehydration. So that's interesting. And then compared to parenteral rehydration, the enteral dehydration route is select all that apply. 82% it's safer, 56 it's cheaper, 8% less effective. So they don't really believe, um, yeah, cool. at least it's less effective and enabling the caregivers 55%. So I'm going to stop sharing that. That was okay. Nice.
Thank you. And thank you to everybody for participating in that. I think it is quite telling, like quite a wide variety of fluids that are being used. Um, and there's a study, so let me just try and go there. Okay, so this was a study published recently. I don't know if Susan's going to go into this. I won't spend a lot of time here, but um, published in SAJCH last month um, on hyponatremic dehydration and what the fluid choices are, what practitioners are actually using. And the, the, the only thing I'm going to highlight here is that there's such a spread. So a variety of cases were given. And there is such a spread of fluids that are chosen in different scenarios and different age groups um, and obviously one of the recommendations that get made is that this need, that we need this needs a little bit of attention it needs to be standardized to some extent okay so just a little bit of basics what do we need to think about when we think about dehydration so our primary concern is about the fluid shift and the electrolyte shifts that occur in these situations we need to consider what the compensation mechanisms are that the body is actually trying to do. And obviously the assessment of the degree of dehydration is critical in how we're going to actually implement a management strategy. Then when we are thinking about fluids, I think it's always important to remember that fluids are drugs. I think that sometimes escapes us. We have to prescribe fluids considering what is the actual indication for, for fluid therapy? What is going to be our route of administration? How long are we going to give this for? And very importantly, what are the adverse effects? Um, because they are significant, particularly, well, depending on the routes that we, potentially significant, depending on the routes that we select. And then on the first day of med school, all of us heard this first, do no harm. So Hippocrates is giving this advice. So first our responsibility and our role is obviously to not do any harm. And obviously our best intentions, but so, uh, well, with good intention, we make our choices, but we have to obviously stay up to date with what is best evidence out there. And so that's what we're actually going to discuss. So quickly, sorry, I had to nerd out a little bit, and this is that table that haunts our nightmares when we're preparing for, um, for exams, for college exams and all sorts of things. But just a quick reminder that um, we've got our, obviously our resuscitation fluids and our maintenance fluids. The primary ones that get used in terms of resuscitation are modified ringers and a normal saline. And then just quickly, if you can squeeze over and look at the fluid compositions, so modified ringers, it, like if we consider what our physiological parameters are, it mimics it quite quite nicely and quite well. And obviously being an isotonic solution, which is, which is generally something that we want. We'll speak about that shortly. Um, normal saline, not so normal, obviously it often gets said, but um, still an isotonic solution, which is good. Then when we're getting into our maintenance solutions, there was a lot of um, disparity in what the results that Marty read and also in that um, article that was published, the SAJCH one that we mentioned earlier. But just to note what's really key here is that half DD, which is the majority of people's go-to, is an, a hypotonic solution. So not mimicking physiology at all, really. Um, and pediatric maintenance solution, which we had just a few people still using, but it's it's pretty much, it's just not something that we should be um, considering. It doesn't really have a place and how it was named is quite a bizarre thing. I don't quite know how it got its name, but um, really shouldn't be used in the pediatric setting at all. We're gonna speak a bit more about um, dextrose saline, but it's dextrose saline. And then we'll touch briefly on balanced solutions, things like balsol and plasmalite, which I mean, as the name implies, also very physiological in its makeup. Um, which is um, desirable. Okay, so, it, so now getting into how the STG decisions were made. So when we were discussing resuscitation fluids, when they came up in the review cycle, there was consideration about ringers versus saline. So previously, in previous editions of the STG, only sodium chloride was recommended um, for resuscitation fluids. But in the review cycle, part of the process is looking for the latest um, evidence and the latest data. And this trial, um, a randomized controlled trial that was um, comparing the effectiveness, of, effectiveness of ringers versus saline for the correction of acute severe diarrheal dehydration. And essentially for the primary outcome, um, which was an improvement at clinical status after six hours and normalization of pH, there was so, um, a 
a relative risk of 1.6, but not statistically significant, you can see over there. So essentially saying efficacy of ringers and saline was the same in this trial. And actually that to, um, that at the first interim analysis, they actually stopped this trial early because they were finding that there was no difference in the um, effect sizes. So no significant changes in the secondary outcomes either, electrolytes, renal function, gas parameters, or duration of hospital stay. And so that was key in terms of adding this um, or considering the addition of ringers to the um, to, as an alternative therapy uh, in the resuscitation fluid space. But another thing that is always considered um, in addition to efficacy is the cost factor. And this has actually been updated. Really. So I've we updated this one for January, but when we presented this at the launch of the STGs in, I think it was August or September, this cost differential wasn't quite as, as big as it is now. So saline was marginally cheaper than ringers at that stage, I think it was like nine rand something, so less than the cost difference, but, but this one rand 60 difference or whatever it is, if you multiply that by a million or whatever the procurement number is, actually comes to a significant difference. So, um, the cost is it's comparable, but actually at this stage, ringers has become cheaper. And um, what's quite important to note, or perhaps a point of consideration, is that if we start using more, more ringers lactate, um, and the procurement numbers actually go up, that bargaining capacity will um, potentially push the price down even further. And so at the moment, what's what, how the recommendation is stated is that saline is, is first and then it's recommended as an or. So it said or ring is lactate for all of the indications requiring um, a, a fluid bolus, essentially. So any indication we've listed some of them there. Um, if that price differential does start to increase in the next review cycle and ringers does become cheaper, you might see that switch around. So ringers will be listed first and then say, so that later on. Okay. So summary quickly, initially it used to be just sodium chloride, so normal saline that was recommended for resuscitation fluids, but now modified ringers has been added as an alternative. So equal efficacy, um, and actually a better price point at this stage. All right, now switching across to maintenance fluid therapy. So there's been a major change in the maintenance fluid therapy that's been recommended and that's been recommended throughout the text. So previously the maintenance fluid therapy that was recommended was half dose dextrose, which is what the majority of us said that we are still using um, for maintenance fluids in our, in our children. Um, but that's completely been removed, and the updated recommendation now is to use a normal saline with 5% dextrose or a 5% dextrose saline, same, just a different way of saying it. And the reasoning then behind that updated recommendation um, is the following. So we know, so background, obviously, we know that we've been using it quite extensively. It is a hypotonic solution. And one of the consequences, a major adverse effect of that is iatrogenic hyponatremia. So we are dropping um, by our fluid choices, by the treatment that we are administering, we are dropping the sodiums, obviously all of the complications that relate to that. As we said, Hippocrates doesn't want us to do any harm in the first instance. And so that's obviously far from ideal. The evidence base that we drew from for that was a systematic review and, met and meta-analysis that informed the European um, critical care um, clinical practice guidelines. And they actually had, they had five different PICOs. Um, number two is the most relevant for the discussion that we're having at the moment, but all of them quite relevant actually. So what are the indications for IV maintenance fluid therapy? Should we be using isotonic fluids or hypotonic fluids, obviously, as um, is, has been previously used. Um, is there a role for balanced solutions, uh, like the plasma light or the balsol? Um, what should be the composition of IV maintenance fluid therapy? And the last PICO was the volumes that get administered. So um, obviously, the summary of findings table would be quite interesting, but quite detailed to look at. So I've just pulled up. For, so this is for PICO2, which was the isotonic versus hypotonic solutions. If you just look at that forest plot, you can see that um, uh, we've got a statistically significant finding over here. You can see that the little diamond is well on the side of favoring isotonic solutions. 
little bit of heterogeneity, but still favoring, um, quite strongly favoring isotonic solutions over the hypotonic variety. Um, this one I've just included for PICO3, which is related to the balanced solutions. So you can see again over here. So this is, so when it says mean difference over here, it was a number of days that it reduces hospital stay um, or stay in the critical care area. And it was minus 0 0.2, which really translates to a couple of hours. I think it was about four and a half hours that it translates to in terms of um, meaningful. So uh, a statistically significant finding over here, but does it have any meaning clinically? And, and can we, I, I mean, if a couple of hours really probably doesn't make any difference in that sense. So in terms of the balanced solutions, we'll discuss it briefly um, later on in terms of the cost consideration as well. So. They did a very nice summary in a, an infographic about all of their PICOs. So related to PICO one, does IV maintenance fluid therapy um, versus other so oral or enteral impact on clinical outcomes? And there they found that it doesn't really, but particularly in terms of length of hospital stay, we'll discuss this in a little bit of detail later on. Um, but the tonicity of fluids, that's a strong recommendation where they say that actually we need to be using isotonic solutions rather than hypotonic solutions, which has um, been part of general practice for a long time. In terms of balanced solutions, a marginal decrease in um, the length of stay, they weren't able to make a conclusion related to the composition of the fluids. And there's also quite an important finding for PICO5, um, where, whereas we usually use that holiday and SIGA, um, fluid calculation, but actually suggesting that because of SIADH, that's probably too generous and we should be using a restrictive strategy rather than um, giving out quite as much fluid. Um, very interesting study if you do want to know more about fluids, but um, that's just a brief basic overview. And then obviously we look at the evidence, but then we also have to look at the budget impact. And so looking at half DD, it's certainly a more costly option coming in about double the cost of a 5% dextrose saline solution. So if you look at, so that's a 500 mil bag, they only come in 500 mil bags. So if you take it as a cost per liter, it's pretty much double what the, what the newer recommendation is going to be. But then a very interesting um, sort of comparison as well. So if you have got the 200 mil bags of the 5% dextrose saline, just to recognize that the 200 mil bags are often significantly more costly than the one liter bags. So where you have got those options available, usually best to actually select the larger size, the one, the one liter of the, the 200 mil bags. So a summary of that recommend, sorry, summary of that recommendation is obviously that 5% dextrose saline has now completely replaced half DD throughout the standard treatment guidelines nationally for any indication for pediatric IV maintenance fluids. And then just a quick consideration of like, was there a discussion about using Balsol or Plasmalite? And there was, um, but just to note at this stage, it hasn't been included. Um, there is a significant cost differential. And as I discussed already, the benefit that it actually provides was not, um, well, there wasn't any evidence to actually suggest that it was actually beneficial. Okay, so we've retained the 5% dextrose solution in terms of dextrose saline um, for all maintenance indications rather than a balanced solution. Okay, so there have been a couple of um, concerns raised about the um, about tables and, and the advice that's given in the STG being a bit confusing. So just to alert you that this table that that was previously, well, the table that was previously, or this diagram that was previously offered in terms of how to manage fluids has relatively recently in November, it was updated and ratified. So in the newer version of the 2023 STG, um, you can look out for this newer table. Obviously, um, just defining the degrees of dehydration, some of the clinical signs that you might look for, and then how to go about um, implementing the, the fluid management of these patients obviously depending on whether they can tolerate oral rehydration solution. So if, if the version of the SDG that you are seeing doesn't have this diagram, it is slightly up to date. I think we'll try and get the newer version up on the SAPA website and certainly on the Knowledge Hub as well. Okay, and then in the last few minutes, I'm quickly going to make a case for oral rehydration therapy. I think a lot of people said that, that well, 
a majority said that they would prefer that route. But just to remind ourselves always that our bodies have amazing capacities, they, they know what to do if they've got the appropriate and correct substrate. And so if we allow that process just to take place, um, we often, um, we help our patients in ways that we that we really can think. So just to remind us quickly of the, the physiology, and I'm not gonna go into this, but we have an antidiuretic hormone, which is active and, and our patients are able to secrete that in the situation where it's necessary. There's the renal regulation of the water losses in response to the ADH. And then we have our thirst centers, which regulate our intake. And so when our patients are thirsty, we should, or at least wherever it's possible, allow them to, to um, heal themselves to whatever extent is possible. So that was a little bit of physiology, but then going into what the evidence actually says for oral rehydration therapy. And, and many of you actually got all of this stuff. So there is equal, if not slightly superior efficacy at using the oral versus the IV route for rehydration therapy. Obviously fewer complications. So the hyponatremia we already spoke of, and about, um, but also they're not going to drop their sodiums too fast if they are hyponatremic. The drip site, sepsis, the tissue, drip, all of those sorts of things are not complications or things that we don't have to consider. There is, it has been shown that it's associated with a shorter duration of hospitalization, a lower cost, it's easier to administer. And because the caregivers are able to do it, or should be able to help in that situation, um, starting treatment actually is quicker, so it happens sooner. Um, and that probably has some impact on the duration of hospitalization. But we also, in this instance, show the caregiver what is possible and how they can actually um, manage their children if this condition were to recur at home, allow them to go home quicker also because the caregiver is actually the ones managing them. And so in that way, we're empowering them as well. Um, in IMCI, which I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it, but um, one of the, the ways of checking for dehydration is whether the child drinks eagerly. And if they do, we let them, right? So the situation is to let them drink and, and maintain their rehydration orally um, or do their rehydration orally. And obviously only if they fail, then, then um, we need to consider the alternative route. But that is perhaps even in the instance of severe dehydration, not only for the some dehydration or moderate Okay, so just to sum up a few key takeaway messages. Um, so firstly to say that most children should receive maintenance fluids orally, and if not orally, it should be given through a nasogastric tube, or at least an attempt should be made. The second is that if we need rehydration, again, the oral or nasogastric route is preferred over IV wherever that is possible. Um, all children who are getting IV fluids should be reassessed frequently. And by frequently, we mean four hourly. So it's not right up the fluids and then we'll see them tomorrow morning. Ideally, they should be reassessed very quickly with the view of changing them to um, an oral route as soon an oral or nasogastric route as soon as possible. And again, just to mitigate against potential side effects. Um, and then, and I haven't gone into detail on this at all, but Rapid rehydration is generally preferred either orally or IV where it's possible. So over four to six hours, so doing a, a complete rehydration over four to six hours, wherever that's possible, um, is generally preferred. In some instances, obviously, slow, slower rehydration is preferred, but in the majority. And just to say that the, the, the STG's pediatric hospital level is designed for a medical officer in a district hospital. It's not for the tertiary academic centers. Um, and so this guidance is given with a focus on that sort of um, cater of health worker. But I think it remains true for everyone. Okay, another key point, normal nutrition. So to whatever extent it is possible, try not to withhold or delay recommencing nutrition. So allow the child to eat and drink as much as possible and as much as they want to, um, in addition to rehydration fluids. Um, Rehydration is not additional to nutrition. It's not a replacement. So it's it, it's not a replacement. It's additional to the normal child's the nutritional requirements. So don't withhold delay nutrition. Obviously, when we have our SAM patients, any time that you need to use, well, you think that you need to use the IV route, be very 
cautious think again as to whether that actually is necessary because obviously very sensitive um, particularly to fluid boluses but to fluid um, IV at all and wherever possible we need to be using the oral or nasocastric route in these patients who are compromised and then a quick reminder that this is another one of the amendments that was made is that zinc for acute and chronic diarrhea should be given to all patients so 10 milligrams per day, there's no longer a differential by either age or by weight. 10 milligrams per day for anyone, equal efficacy, um, decreased side effect profile for the lower dose. Um, and so just a reminder to, to make sure that that's on your prescription chart as well. So lastly, just acknowledgements. So the whole Pediatric Expert Review Committee and the Secretariat of the Affordable Medicines Act, this is it's quite a task to review these um, the books and the chapters. Dr. Nishlala was the chapter lead on this one. And obviously then just to Gary for the advice and Marty for the advice and inputs that they've given on this presentation. And that's it from me. Thank you, Marty. I'm handing back to you. Thank you so much, um, Tanya. That that was great and a lot of information. And we've got so many questions about this fluids. People want their half DD. Um, and I think that's what we are going to have to answer. So one of the first questions is something that I've also been wondering about. So it's from um, Lincoln Solomon in the Q&As. And that is, why should we not be recommending ringers lactate first instead of normal sal saline as our primary resource solution? I mean, yeah. so, and yeah, maybe like it, perhaps if there's data that suggests that it is superior, then that would be the preferred. But what we were, yeah, I mean, but the evidence, and obviously this is what I was we were talking about now, the evidence is that there's the equal efficacy. So the study was, wasn't was necessarily designed as a non-inferiority trial. Um, or they don't actually state how it was designed, but we saw that there was no difference. And so, and, and, and if there is additional data that, that says that Ringers is superior as a primary resource solution, please send it through or join the committee for the next review cycle. Um, but we'd love to see it obviously. And so always open to like looking at those things, but at this stage, the evidence that we have is that they're equal efficacy. And so there's no reason to prioritize one over the other. Yeah, but at least we can still have favorites in life. So you can still. <laughs> Your ringers. Um, what do you say about that, Susan? I just want to get your... Uh, so so you, you'll have to watch this space because there's a huge study, the Prompt Bolus trial, which is currently ongoing. So when the results of that's published, looking exactly at this so in terms of isotonic crystalloids, looking at saline versus balanced solutions in kids as a mm. resuscitation uh, thing. And that that's in, enrolling like a couple of 20, 30,000 pediatric patients across multiple centers. So watch this, watch this space. But I think the the bottom line is it's indisputable. An isotonic, an isotonic crystalloid, is the way to go. And like you say, we do have our favorites, but we'll wait for the evidence and see. Thank you, Shagan. You want to take the next one? Yeah. Thank you so much, Susan. I think uh, we, there are tons of questions that are coming up in the chats and we're trying our best to answer them as we go along. Uh, so some of them we'll leave at the end. So we maybe just do one or two more, Marty, if that's all right. So the next question, so I think this is, is, is an important one. And so how do we balance best practice um, or safe practice guidelines versus what is practically realistic? And that's from Michelle Zuckerberg. So if anyone wants to give that a go. Well, I think Michelle would pro I mean, so I just know her and she would be with her years and years and years, decades of experience would probably be best placed. But that is obviously, I think, where our clinical skill and the experience that comes in. And so best practice, I mean, evidence is one thing. And obviously we have to consider what the evidence says and suggests and practice as much as possible to, um, to keep to that. But real life does sometimes differ. And so, and... Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think that I'm saying much more than is is like intuitive, but we have to do what what we what we need to do in those situations. We know that sometimes all of these recommendations, we know that sometimes people just don't have access to the things that we're recommending, even though it is an essential medicine or that's in, in these guidelines. Um, and so how do we get around that? I mean, that's a health system issue that that takes a, it's a very different discussion. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if anybody else has any additions on that. 
shall also advise us to maybe just set a poll of who actually do have these pre-mixed um, DEX saline available at the institutions. And actually 60% of people at, working at um, primary and secondary or, or first and second level hospitals do not have them available. And this is important for us to note because I think we do need to go back to, to um, the SDG committee, Tanya, and say that um, we actually need to speak to the pharmacies and um, they need to have these things available if we are advocating for it um because if you start mixing dextrose with your saline it's going to have cost implications yeah. dextrose is very expensive and that's the same feel, thing that i feel about mixing ringers lactate into a five percent it is quite costly so that is just something um yeah that's quite interesting i don't know how you feel about that susan shagan I think uh, just yeah. I think uh, what's very important, and I'm going to answer this not from where I'm working now, but when I did a brief stint in private, often when you did prescribe fluids, even in private practice, some of them weren't available and they had to be hunted down from different wards, um, because um, one of the hospitals I worked with had tons of pediatric maintenance solution, which um, I'm not going to lie, I'm not the biggest fan of at all. Um, but when I asked for ringers or or something like that, that you know they actually had to source that and that took some time. So. You know, it, it being practical and, and looking what you have available to assist a child in the immediate setting, I think that's very important. Um, but obviously, we look at the guidelines so that we can always plan and, and you know, do better for our kids. Um, so I think that's very important. Um, but yeah, I think I think that struggle of finding what you need is difficult wherever you are, uh, especially when you're doing something new. Great. So I think we'll try and answer more of these fluid questions in the chats. And um, hopefully Susan is going to answer some of that for us in her talk as well. So I think, Shagan, we can move on. Sure. Um, give me two seconds. I'm just uh, getting something on my phone. So everyone, I'd just like to introduce Dr. S uh, Susan Murphy. Um, so again, thank you for everyone for partaking and I'm sure Susan's going to answer tons of questions for us so hopefully we don't have to answer everything in the chat. So Susan is a senior pediatric intensivist who has worked in pediatric critical care for the past 13 years um, and she's based in the PICU at Barra um, where she has where she's the lead for clinical multidisciplinary patient discussions. Um, two of her passions are teaching and clinical ethics. Um, she's a director of the pediatric basic course, which I encourage everyone to try and do, uh, based in Johannesburg. And she's also teaches on the APLS course. Um, apart from clinical ethics, um, her interests include high flow humidified oxygen, optimizing analgesia in PICU and quality improvement interventions. Um, and my favorite part of the bio is that she's also a mom of two girls. Um, and counts the job of raising them to be independent and self-confident, kind humans to be the most important. Um, so I love that you added that. So Susan, let me just hand over to you and we look forward to your talk. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone for inviting me here. And um, I'm, I see all the questions and I'm so excited because I'm hoping that we can answer some of these things for you. So first things first, I think when it comes to hypernatremia, this is sometimes how we feel when we're approaching a kid with hyponatremia. And the reason for that is that there is very little consensus in terms of management protocols for these kids. Um, there is an awful lot of conflicting data um, and there is not a lot of very good high quality data out there to guide us in what to do for these children. And specifically with hyponatremic gastro, which I've been asked to focus on, um, we've got no randomized control trials um, telling us what is the ideal fluid. And we've also got really no high quality evidence for what is a safe rate of correction um, for serum sodium. Um, and Tanya referred to this, and, and this was a, a, a survey done um, among South African clinicians, and these were doctors um, senior senior clinicians looking after pediatric patients who were given some clinical vignettes looking at how they would manage children with hypernatremia. Um, and as she pointed out, she really showed you the slide, there was um, significant variability um, amongst uh, survey um, uh, clinicians who, who answered the survey in terms of the choice of IV fluids. She already showed you that slide. There was um, a huge amount of variability in terms of how clinicians calculated fluid requirements and also variation in terms of how um, and what things they looked at when evaluating um, response to treatment. 
Um, and I just wanted to sort of show the, the second case study, which is pretty much um, the typical kind of case that we'll be discussing here when you talk about managing the hypernatremic gastro. It was a six-week-old infant who came in with severe dehydration, a sodium of 180, and severe metabolic acidosis. And you can see, as uh, Tanya pointed out, the huge variety in terms of what sort of fluids clinicians decided to that they would prescribe. So these little ones that I've highlighted in pink, um, these are hypotonic fluids. I'm not quite sure what the modified solution containing sodium bicarb is, but if it's the kind of fluid that we sometimes use in the ICU, it's also um, hypotonic. And then these ones highlighted in black were isotonic fluid, of which normal saline was um, much more popular than our balanced uh, isotonic crystalloid plasma light B um, over here. And um, and so people still, as we've seen, still like the hypotonic fluids um, for these patients. I wanted to start, I opted to start with this graphic um, as we delve into the management of hypernatremic gastro. And the reason why I wanted to put this really simple diagram up is just as a reminder that not all children with hyponatremia are going to be dehydrated. Okay, so don't don't forget this category here. Um, and in some cases, patients may be volume replete um, and not need excessive volumes of fluid. Um, and then for those who do need fluid, so who are losing um, fluid, they're not really losing pure free water and um, they're losing electrolytes as well but they're losing more water than electrolytes which results in this um, picture of hyponatremia and so for that for that reason um, your first approach is always a clinical assessment um, and hydration status is a very important part of this um, because you don't at the, suppose at the start of your treatment as well as continually during your management of these children, not to just be treating a number, but your clinical assessment um, and bearing in mind the other things such as drugs, uh, previous fluids, iatrogenic administration of um, sodium, or underlying disease or medical condition, which might give the picture of hyponatremia, but the patient is not um, dehydrated. And also to be aware in terms of how you manage them, that the management is not a one-size-fits-all strategy um, for hyponatremia and may involve things like just decreasing the amount of sodium being administered or stopping drugs that are contributing to the hyponatremia volume replacement um, and it's important that we don't give excessive amounts of free water and what we mean by free water is uh, water with very low sodium or zero sodium um, concentration because that may result in um, precipitous drops in your shifts in your electrolytes um, and maybe um, result in a sort of severe adverse effects so I was asked as, as part of my brief for this talk was really just to address the management of hyponatremia as it's outlined in the EDL um, STG um, guidelines that have recently been published. And hyponatremia is covered in two places in this handbook. Um, and the first place that it's covered is in chapter two, which is the elementary tract um, pathologies and the management of acute diarrhea. Um, and the hyponatremia that may ensue there. And then the other place where the management of hyponatremia is, um, is dealt with is in the ICU chapter, chapter 11. Um, and I'm just going to, and there's a little bit of, um, and these two chapters don't really um, sort of tell the same story. And I'm going to quickly run through through what, what you see in these chapters just briefly so you can see um so you can see what I'm talking about. So this is the diarrhea management chapter. Um, and in here what they do is they've divided up the management of hyponatremia into moderate hyponatremia, which they have defined really by a serum sodium, um, which I kind of have a bit of a problem with that because I think it's a clinical assessment of hydration status to decide whether a patient is moderate 
has moderate hyponatremic dehydration or severe, um, and it's not the actual um, sodium number. And um, the advice is isotonic um, crystalloid as a resuscitation fluid, which I think is um, which is good. I mean, isotonic crystalloid, um, you can sort of say is a balanced better than an isotonic saline. Um, I don't think there's good evidence to say that one is better than the other and you use what you've got. Um, and they emphasize the low, um, the slow reduction and correction of the sodium. And then they advise that in the cases of moderate, um, moderate dehydration, if the child is able to drink to give oral rehydration solution, and then if not to replace IV, um, and they're using the traditional fluid maintenance re requirements, so the 421 or 150-20, and then they're suggesting that um, you add a 50 to 70 mil per kilo on top of that for your rehydration, which kind of works out to those of us who are used to working out in terms of percentage dehydration, which I still find pretty useful, especially if you have a baseline weight of the child and you've got the weight now, you can actually calculate the exact percentage. This would be equivalent to adding on an extra 5 or 7 percent um, dehydration, and that's where they get to these numbers here. So in essence, what they're saying is, um, for these kids, you give them maintenance plus an extra 50 mils per kilo per day. They are suggesting that you give um, oral rehydration solution, which I'd like to point out, it's got a much lower sodium concentration than what they're recommending for um, IV replacement, which they're actually recommending a normal saline with dextrose, and we can see where that came from now. Um, and then for oral, they're recommending quite a huge volume here, 200, it works out to be when I did the calculations about 250% of maintenance for oral rehydration. And, and this for me is interesting because there's just such a big discrepancy in terms of the sodium content for what we're happy to give intravenously for these kids compared to what we're saying is best to give orally. Um, and then for severe hyponatremia, what they're recommending here, they don't really prescribe fluid rates but I'm presuming it sort of follows on from the previous and maybe, you know, they don't give specific prescribing guidance. But what they recommend here is that you give uh, sodium chloride with 5% dextrose plus 20 millimoles of potassium chloride. And this is what I did when I saw that because that's 174 millimoles per liter of chloride that you're giving to a patient, which is astounding. Um, and you're giving uh, more potassium than what traditional half darrows had, which was only 17 millimoles per liter. And my concerns with that are really the acidotic child who we know shifts potassium from the intracellular component, um, as well as the severely dehydrated kids who may have acute kidney injury or not be passing adequate volumes of urine or going on to renal failure. And now we're giving them huge amounts of potassium um, chloride. So um, this raised um, some eyebrows um, for me. This is the ICU chapter, which um, deals with hyponatremia. And in contrast, this chapter is quite vague. Um, and I think the reason why this is quite vague is because by the, the acute management of things like gastroenteritis is usually well on its way before these children come up to the ICU and the kinds of patients we see with hypernatremia tend to be a much more varied bunch. Um, we often see a lot of diabetes insipidus with our neurological patients. Um, and there they sort of, the, the basic general guidance is that you treat the hypernatremia according to what the cause is. And that may involve replacing free water. In the case of something like diabetes insipidus, it may involve giving desmopressin. It may involve um, uh, stopping offending drugs. It may involve replacing the volumes that are being lost with whatever the equivalent electrolyte concentration is of the fluid being lost. So they tend to be a little bit uh, less specific and, and less prescriptive, which may also be um, sort of not so helpful because they don't give too much details. So I think I think what I'd like to try and do is to try and give some clarity um, to you in the last sort of 10 minutes that I have left in terms of the management of this hyponatremic uh, gastro patient um, and try to help answer the commonest questions which I think clinicians have 
um, for these kids? And these are the questions that com most commonly get asked. How much fluid should we give these kids? What type of fluid should we be pre prescribing? How fast or how slow are, are we, is safe to drop the serum sodium? And what do we do when the sodium falls too fast? And what do we do when the serum sodium um, is either not budging or is continuing to go up? And so I'm going to tackle these questions one by one. Um, the first being, what fluid should we be given to kids with hyponatremic dehydration? I always find it useful to think of fluids in terms of three categories. So maintenance, rehydration, and ongoing losses. And maintenance fluids... Um, if the child has moderate dehydration, then always best to give enteral feeds if possible. Um, by all means, this is, um, this is calories for your children and it's going to meet their maintenance fluid requirements. For those children who are um, unable to take orally, so often those that fall into the very severe, then I, I would recommend an isotonic balanced crystalloid with 5% dextrose. And I'll get into the next couple of slides, my evidence for this recommendation. Um, rehydration, the best uh, rehydration would be, as Tanya alluded to in her talk, would be if your patient can take orally to rehydrate with oral rehydration salts if they're available. And the reason for this is that in terms of gastro, the electrolyte composition of the fluid being lost is closely mimicked by the oral rehydration solution electrolyte composition. If your children are unable to take orally, um, then again, an isotonic balanced crystalloid with dextrose, I think is a suitable fluid to use. And ongoing losses, again, you should re be replacing with fluid that closely resembles the electrolyte composition of the fluid being lost. In the case of gastrointestinal losses, so vomiting and diarrhea, you can see the sodium, potassium, and chloride compositions of these fluids. Potassium is definitely needed. Um, normal saline doesn't contain potassium. Both of your balanced crystalloids, which we have, Ringer's lactate and plasmolite B, have got four millimoles per liter of potassium in them. And then also, I mean, we're specifically focusing on hyponatremic gastro, but to consider kids who are hyponatremic from other causes, like your burns patients who are losing a lot of interstitial fluid, you can see you would want to give, again, a balanced isotonic crystalloid might may be great, but that's sort of beyond the scope of what I was asked to talk about. So why do I say isotonic balanced crystalloid? Well, nice guidelines suggest isotonic crystalloids. And they cover both bases here because they say in the range, sodium in the range of 131 to 154. So either a balanced, a balanced salt solution or normal saline is acceptable. And the importance of monitoring um, your electrolytes for your fluids. And this comes from best available um, evidence in terms of what is an acceptable maintenance fluid. So as Tanya said, half darrows out the window, isotonic crystalloid as a maintenance solution. And um, I was interested to hear the talk, so I'm coming in now, I feel like this is a debate, <laughs> and, and I'm coming in to, to be the, the person who stirs the pot. So we often in ICU talk about abnormal saline, and the reason why um, saline is less popular for us, and particularly in the ICU setting, is for two reasons. Um, and the first is that from adult studies, there's been a lot of um, concern about the effects on the kidneys, in particular, the very high chloride load that occurs. And even in studies in normal patients who've been infused um, normal saline, they've noticed change in renal velocity in response to the high chloride load. And the second reason is the, the hyperchloremic acidosis that occurs as a result of the um, high chloride, which results in loss of bicarb in order to maintain that strong iron difference, which, um, which can be problematic in these patients. And Tanya referred to this as well. I think she did uh, refer to it in one of her slides. So this is a large systematic review and meta-analysis looking specifically in the intensive care unit. And it looked at really, uh, we had r randomized control trials, um, most of them, um, 38,000 patients, adult and pediatric. 
And the acute kidney injury really seemed to only be a problem in adult patients. So that hasn't been translated in the pediatric patient group. And as she mentioned, the shorter length of stay in, um, in pediatrics only, but was not shown in adult patients when using balanced crystalloids um, as a maintenance um, solution. And then the question that always comes up when I when I start punting isotonic uh, balanced crystalloids is people say, but Susan, if the sodium is so high and, and you're giving a fluid that's got 130 millimoles of sodium, are you not going to um, drop the sodium too quickly? And this was a really nice, these guys in King Edward, they follow this protocol where they administered a sodium content, which was two thirds of the serum sodium level. And using that protocol, they safely could decrease their serum sodium uh, by 0.5 to 1 millimoles per liter. And if you do the maths, that um, unless your serum sodium is above 195, in other words, you, using an isotonic balanced, balanced crystalloid, which has a sodium of 130, you still manage to get that two-thirds of the serum sodium um, uh, met. And so you probably can be safe in giving these solutions, even in very high sodium levels. This is another study done in Israel. And it's interesting to show here, you see on this right-hand side, you see the rate, how the sodium came down and they had a decline of about 10 millimoles in 10 to 12 millimoles in a 24 hour period, which is exactly um, what we sort of aim for. And you can see that in this particular institution, their protocol involved giving um, progressively more hypotonic fluid. So this is the serum sodium and this is the sodium concentration in the fluid. Um, and even giving this very hypotonic fluid with only 80 millimoles of sodium in the end, they didn't see a precipitous drop. You still had that very safe drop in serum sodium. Um, coming back to this slide here, this, this bicarb, modified bicarb solution, I had a look at this and I wondered if this is all our WITS graduates coming through our ICU. And sometimes we use this fluid called Omar Light. And we use this particularly where hyperchloremic, um, where hyperchloremic uh, normal anion gap acidosis is becoming a problem, where we create a fluid which is basically a rehydration solution with extra sodium bicarb and some extra potassium, and it's slightly hypotonic. Um, but the advantage of this is that because you've got almost double the amount of sodium compared to chloride, it um, it deals with the hyponatremic, uh, the hyperchloremic acidosis quite nicely. What volume of fluid should we be giving? Well, I think in these kids, maintenance fluid, again, consider in terms of these three groups, maintenance closer to traditional maintenance calculations, so not restricting. Um, how to calculate the rehydration volumes? I still think that um, using the percentage dehydration, especially if you have a weight, is the most useful way um, using a clinical assessment to guide your volume calculations. It may be useful to calculate free water deficit, especially if you find that your serum sodium is not dropping sufficiently and you now want to add in some free water. Um, and I'll, I'll show you that in future slides. And how to give it, so there's various things, and I think Tanya alluded to this, to this as well. In the literature it's described, you can either give both the rehydration and maintenance over 24 to 48 hours. Some advocate giving the maintenance over 24 hours and, and eight and giving half of the rehydration over the first eight hours, followed by the next half over 16 hours. And some advocate giving all the rehydration fluid over six, the first um, eight hours and then all the maintenance over the next 16 hours. But there really is no good evidence to show that one way is better than the other. So we can't make any recommendations and then give your ongoing losses. What is the safe rate of decline in serum sodium? Well, the big thing we all want to be, we all scared of is this, as the brain makes idiogenic osmols and the rapid correction of it will result in fluid shifts in the brain and cerebral edema. Bearing in mind that rapid onset of hyponatremia may also give you an osmotic demyelination um, syndrome. So consensus has always been to aim for a decline of about 12 millimoles per litre over 24 hours. But as I said at the beginning of my talk, there's really no good evidence for this. Um, it's, it's it has some physiological plausibility because of the, the way we know you need time for the idiogenic osmols to, um, to dissipate. Um, referring back to this King Edward study, they, they had divided their patients up into three groups. 
it was a retrospective study. Uh, those whose sodium was corrected at one, less than one millimole per kilo per hour, those where the sodium was corrected at one to two millimoles per kilo per hour, and those where the sodium was corrected at more than two millimoles per kilo per hour. And between those three groups, they didn't show any statistically significant differences in the neurological sequelae. Those that had a rate of decline above one millimole per liter per hour, 18% of them had neurological sequelae, but it wasn't significant compared to the groups who had a slower correction of sodium. And interestingly, the two kids who died from neurological uh, devastating injuries all fell into the less than one millimole per kilo per hour correction group. And then an Israel study showed that there was no neurological adverse events when the serum sodium declined at 0.65 millimoles per liter per hour. So probably we should stick to um, this. It probably is conservative, but rather safe than sorry. What happens if it's not declining um, fast enough? Well, then the, this my recommendation is that you should increase the amount of free water administered. And this calculation is useful. Um, and I've added in here the, the free water composition of the various different types of fluids. So 5% dextrose and tap water is 100% free water. Half saline is 50% and normal saline is 0%. And what you can do in these cases is to continue on with your isotonic crystalloid and then add in sort of 25% of that volume as free water. And then if the sodium is still not declining, 50% uh, as free water and, and go up on your free water. And then important thing is to monitor your electrolytes to make sure that it's not dropping uh, precipitously. If it does drop precipitously, then you either need to increase the sodium content of your administered fluid decrease how much free fluid, uh, free water you're giving and decrease how fast you're giving it. So if I can tie everything up in a bow, um, bearing in mind that there's not great evidence, so I've chosen to label the Susan's sensible suggestions for management of hyponatremic dehydration. Um, I would recommend maintenance being oral feeds, um, if, if possible, best always first choice. If not, an isotonic crystalloid, and I still would prefer a balanced crystalloid with dextrose. Rehydration, an isotonic crystalloid, and I still would prefer a balanced crystalloid simply because of the fact that the electrolyte composition mimics that of plasma um, uh, better because of the potassium containing um, and because we know that having a slightly lower sodium is not, um, is not detrimental, slightly hypotonic. Um, I would consider a fluid with a higher percentage of free water if the sodium isn't declining and still aim for a conservative um, reduction in your serum sodium um, by 10 to 12 millimoles per liter per day. And then your losses should be replaced with a solution which resembles the type of fluid lost in equal volumes. And remember to monitor the response, which is not only the, what's happening to the serum sodium, but what's happening to the child clinically, what's happening to their perfusion, what's happening to the level of consciousness, what's happening with their urine output, what's happening with their other electrolytes, um, in, including things like lactate, um, chloride, etc., cetera, um, et cetera. And now that I've sort of kicked open the hornet's nest, um, we, can, we can head for head for questions, I think. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Susan. I love that sensible, the Susan sensible suggestions, the SSS solution. Um, yeah, um, I'm going to start to head into these questions because there's quite a lot. Um, the first one I want to ask you is, is there a place of using soda bic in severe dehydration? And I think that's where your Oma light comes in a little bit as well. But if you can yeah. maybe look a little bit about soda bic in the severe metabolic acidotic gastro. Yeah, I, I don't think just um, sort of boluses of so hypertonic um, sodium bicarb is useful in these patients because what they need is they need fluid resuscitation and that's going to take time. The one instance where we would consider bicarb would be actually only with the omelite. And that really is where you have children who now in the resuscitation, usually it occurs post the acute resuscitation phase where they're getting better, but because you've given them loads and loads of normal saline, what's happening is they're developing a hyperchloremia. 
And so their pH is still slightly acidotic. They've still got a base excess of minus 10. And if you calculate the anion gap, it's a normal anion gap. And in those cases, we use this Omar light. And as I mentioned, it's not the sodabic that we're using. It's not the bicarb. It's the fact that what we're giving is we're giving twice as much by adding the sodabic, we're giving twice as much sodium as chloride. So we're in essence managing to create a fluid that's a low chloride fluid. And what that's doing is it's correcting the hypochloremic component of that metabolic acidosis that's still sticking around. Makes yeah. sense. Um, so a next question, please explain how normal saline plus dextrose is regarded as isotonic, more so with added potassium. Yeah, so normal saline is an isotonic fluid and any of the fluids that we add dextrose to, dextrose will contribute to the osmolarity, um, but it doesn't uh, change the, the tonicity. And the reason for that is that glucose freely moves across membranes. So when you give it, it doesn't cause a tonicity gradient because it freely moves. So for the same reason why if we add, uh, we make a 5% dextrose solution of plasma light B and ringers, we're not making it more, we not, we may ch we're changing the osmolarity, but we're not changing the tonicity. It's still isotonic. If you add potassium though, you're making it hypotonic because if say, for example, you're adding 20 millimoles of potassium chloride, you're adding another 40 millimoles to that 308 uh, millim osmolar, you know, tonicity already. So you're making it in essence, 348 is the tonicity. If you take, if you take normal saline and add 20, uh, 20 millimoles of sodium chloride. So then you're giving a hypertonic fluid all right, so that's 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 what you need to bear in mind. So most electrolytes that you add in chloride, sodium, uh, potassium, those are going to exert effects on the tonicity, but glucose doesn't cause um, alterations in the tonicity of the fluid. Perfect. Next, thank question. you. Thanks, you Susan. Want to again? Yeah, let me let me tackle a few. Um, so I'm gonna. I think one of the questions here. I'm just gonna skip to this one. I think you may have touched on already. So I'm just going to go through it. Is there space to use sodium bicarb with hyponatremic dehydration and severe metabolic acidosis? I think that's going on to your omalite uh, solution. Um, and then the next question I think we should just look at, and, and you know, this depends on where we work, and, and um, it is, is there a difference between how we manage hyponatremic dehydration for neonates versus pediatric patients? Yeah, so you maybe need to ask a neonatologist that because this is, I'm not a neonatologist. And I know that the renal handling of sodium is quite different in neonates compared to pediatric patients. But I would, um, I would say that considering the fact that they don't uh, handle sodium loads as well would be even more evidence for using something with a slightly lower sodium like an isotonic balanced crystalloid because the sodium is 130 millimoles per liter for that compared to 154 in your normal saline. Yeah, so I don't know if there's any neonatologists who could chip in there, but um, yeah. Thank you. Um, and I'm just going to jump to the next one quickly because just for time. Um, so Lincoln Solomon has asked, he said, uh, free water, if normal saline has 0% free water, um, then surely half normal saline should be the preferred um, solution to address hyponatremia. Yeah, I mean, Lincoln, so you, if you're having issues with um, the sodium coming down using an isotonic uh, crystalloid, so in other words, we those kinds of patients that we've all seen where you've prescribed maintenance and rehydration, ongoing losses, and the sodium's just not budging, and then you, you need to consider working out the free water deficit and adding some free water then by all means, you can, instead of going to something with zero free water, you can be a little bit conservative and say, I'm going to shift to something that's got 50% uh, uh, free water as part of my fluid, but not in its entirety. Um, and the problem with that, with, with half normal saline, is that it's very hypotonic. Um, so that is the problem with using it straight off the bat. But if you're finding that your sodium is not shifting, you, you may need to add something with um, less free water and then half normal saline 
or rehydration solution, which is half normal saline with 5% dextrose, may be something that you would consider to give like a percentage of your fluid as that, like 30 to 40% as that, just to shift the sodium down. That's just a thought. Yeah. I don't have great evidence for that, but it seems physiologically plausible and pragmatic to me. Okay, Susan, I want to ask you this. Um, should we routinely be adding potassium chloride to our 5% deck saline? Um, and I think especially in district hospitals that wait quite a long time for a, a gas or blood results to come back, would you recommend adding potassium from the beginning in patients with gastro? Like I would, like I mentioned when I when I addressed that slide with the severe hyponatremia, where they mention where they advise adding twenty millimoles, I, I have some concerns, especially with the severe kids, where you don't know what the renal function is like, and um, where you're not sure what you know how much urine they're they're passing. Um, I, I would be a bit nervous to do that, um, especially adding large volumes, bearing in mind that your isotonic uh, balance solutions do have four millimoles per liter of potassium. So I would caution if you're not in a setting where you can monitor electrolytes um, and get your blood results um, reasonably quickly um, to, to rather stay away from routinely adding potassium to these children, especially when you're not sure what their renal function is like. Yeah, I want to tackle three of these questions in one. Okay, so um, first of all, ask adding soda big to half DD for hyponatremia to bring up the sodium concentration of the fluid. So that's how you have your Vitz cocktail. We've got the KZN cocktail where we often add bicarb to half DD, and especially in these hyponatremic kids. So, um, what do you feel about that? Or how much how much bicarb are you adding to half DD? Because bearing in mind. So although the osmolarity of half DD is around 422, most the actual tonicity is about 154. So how much are you adding? So we usually bring it up to a sodium sitting around about 100 to 120, depending on what the serum sodium of the patient. So like 40 to 60 mils, basically, you're adding. Yeah. So you're still giving a hypotonic fluid, isn't it? You're still giving a, a fluid with a tonicity of about 220. Um and then the, the the other thing with half DD is the excessive amount of potassium that's in there. It's 17 millimoles per liter. So yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I think we we we've we've got good evidence that isotonic crystalloids are best. Um in some cases, if your sodiums are not coming down, you may want to think about a hypotonic fluid. But um so you end up using yeah. white, white yeah. as well. This, the question um, from the Cape Town people as well, because in Cape Town, we used to use a chloride-free cocktail where we mix mm. five to, with, with bicarb, um, mm. and adding potassium if they need. Um, so also mm -hmm. kind of a bit of bicarb um, into it, especially if you've got that hyperchloremic acidosis. Mm. Yeah, I think we, it's pretty much similar to what we're doing with the omolite, isn't it? We, what we're doing is we're trying to create a fluid that's got more sodium than chloride in various different ways, bearing in mind that the tonicity is probably slightly low for all of them. I think we're probably all doing similar things. It would be nice to have a fluid that uh, that was pre-packed and ready and could do these sorts of things for us. But um, But yeah. But bearing in mind, you're less likely to run into problems off the bat with hyperchloremia if you start off with a balanced crystalloid as opposed to lots of normal saline. Yeah. Um, I want to ask both you and Tanya, and it was probably one of the last questions that we will have time for. So when we use um, Ringer's lactate as our maintenance fluids, um, do you need to put in 5% or do you need to put in 50% dextrose in order to make it a 5% to prevent hypoglycemia? Or do you find that just running on them on Ringer's lactate that they actually um, maintain their glucose? Because I think for cost that's been, and, and for mixing fluids, yeah. that's been, we've been confronted to lot yeah i think it depends on the age of the patient so you tend to find the older children tend to not run into too much problems with their um, glucose especially if you're able to start enteral feeds early for these kids um but the smaller kids um you you know hypoglycemia is a complication that you really want to avoid because of the severe neurological sequelae that can occur 
And so for those kids, um, I don't know, Tanya, what you would say, but I, I think that in those smaller, the smaller infants, um, adding the dextrose. And, and I'm hoping, I believe in the pipeline, there is going to be an, a balanced pediatric isotonic crystalloid with dextrose in it. It's in the pipeline. So we will be getting something like that soon that we won't have to be adding dextrose to it to make it a 5% dextrose. Yeah. Yeah, I think just to say, I mean that often that that lactate does convert and it's and able to be able to be utilized, and so the need to add glucose and perhaps in the majority of cases is probably not there for the ringers, um, but but perhaps this is in a certain in select instances, and it's always going to be patient by patient that you have to consider, and perhaps for the smaller ones there is a need. I sort of make the point because we've spoken a lot about mixing and making up our, our cocktails and I know that that's common practice in um, in in academic centers and in, in ICU because we've got a lot of intensivists here but but the but in situations where again just bringing it back to that district hospital level or for in more inexperienced prescribers I think that the idea of adding things into bags and doing all of those complex calculations I think wherever it is possible to try and Avoid now. I know that I am. Um, I'm speaking again, like when you're speaking about very technical and, and um, complex patients. But for the majority, hopefully, or for for a large proportion of patients, that hopefully isn't necessary. Um, and 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 just remembering that there is a potential to make um, errors when we're mixing all of those those things, as well as the introduction of infection when we are mixing bags. So just that as a something at the back of our minds as well. No, absolutely. Thank you so much. I think we've come to the end of the session. So just to kind of summarize, I think even the last question in the Q&A about using Ms. Potlaw, or how do we actually um, get the potassium up if it's, if it's low? I think one of the things that's useful for me is to use the gut if you can, if it's possible. So for maintenance fluids, if there's no reason to keep the patient null by mouth, use the gut. And then also you can use um, Ms. Potlaw to get up um, the potassium if they have hypokalemia. Um, I think we should try and avoid mixing too much of our own fluids because they, they can be problems and um, introducing infections. But it is nice to have a recipe, and especially in these hyponatremic um, patients, um, you do want to watch that sodium not to drip it too quickly. And I, I do also think that something like a, a ringus lactate or isotonic balance fluid is, is the way to go to for those hyponatremic dehydrations. So I don't know if Tanya and, Su and Susan just each want to have one last word of wisdom and Chagan, and then we're going to end. So Susan, your words of wisdom. I'm going to put this slide back up here. And, and I know all of us intensivists, you know, we were actually looking at our ordering. We don't, uh, I see, we, we don't have normal saline. <laughs> so it's like, it's just not a thing. So, uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a disciple for the isotonic balance crystalloid. It just makes so much physiological sense. I do understand the costs benefits, but I kind of wonder whether, um, whether we're losing out on what's best patient care you know over over cost um and i'm just gonna put the my little susan sensible suggestions this is not a gospel it's a it's a suggestion um i've given you some of the evidence um to to show where i'm coming from and i hope that it's been helpful thank you so much tanya Okay, so my last word, and and I think I'll sound like a bit of a struck record, but mine is wherever possible, use the oral route. So, so we've spoken a lot, but really just oral rehydration. It's the safest way to go. It's the cheapest way to go. It's very efficacious. So wherever possible, just give it to the patient in their mouth. Use the enteral route, even for the medications um, like potassium. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the time, we'll be winning there as well. Thank you. And from Shagan, budding um, in. <laughs> I'm not going to give many words of wisdom. I think uh, Susan and Tanya's. But I just want to say thank you to everyone for attending. Um, I'm very chuffed with how many people have been here and all the amazing questions. And I, I hope all of you consider being a member of SARPA. We'd love to see you being part of our, our organization. To, you know, make us very happy. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, and we'll see you next month in the end of February, so last Wednesday of every month, and we're going to talk about how to decrease childhood mortality. Thank you so much, and thanks again to our wonderful speakers. Bye-bye.
Thank, Thank you. you.